Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and today we are concluding the Rise of Samayi Let's Talk Lore series with episode 10, titled Co-Regent Again. Now last episode, we ended as Samayi completed his conquest of Leodong around late August, early September in the year 238. Following this victory, Samayi remained in Leodong for roughly two months to allow his army to recover and to facilitate the forced migration of the local Han population back inland. Then by November of 238, he started his march back to the Western Front as he and his 40,000 troops had to go back to their original garrisons. But on January 22nd, 239, as Sima Yi's army just arrived in a place called Bai Wu in Henei Commandery, an imperial summon arrives ordering Sima Yi to immediately travel to the capital of Luoyang with haste as the emperor requested his audience immediately. Then just as Sima Yi was preparing to leave, another imperial summon arrives with the same command. Soon, five such summons dated just three days apart would reach Sima Yi's hands. And realizing something must be terribly wrong, Sima Yi quickly prepared a carriage and raced towards Luoyang, which was 400 li, or 200 kilometers away from Bai Wu. And with no regard for his horses or his own health, as it must have been quite the bumpy ride, Sima Yi would complete this journey in just one day and night, as he worried that Cao Rui must not be long for this world. Legend says that right after Sima Yi had conquered Liaodong, he had a dream the first night he was in Xiangping, where Emperor Cao Rui was lying on his lap and asking him to look at his face. And when Sima Yi looked at Cao Rui's face in his dream, he noticed that Cao Rui was deathly pale. Recalling the dream now, Sima Yi feared the worst as Cao Rui's sudden death could mean upheaval in the capital and the Wei court, as Hare did not have any surviving sons, with all three of his biological sons dying in their infancy. Now, secession was not completely unplanned, as Hare did adopt other members of the Tall clan to ensure that he at least had available candidates to make into a crown prince, should that need arise. But even these efforts had some issues, as the first son he adopted in Cao Yin also died young, and this is when Cao Rui finally adopted Cao Feng, who was just barely 8 years old at this time. So given these uncertainties in succession and the recent worries about his own loyalty from the imperial clan, Sima Yi knew he needed to be present at such a delicate moment. Fortunately, he would make it back in time on January 23rd, 239, as he would see Emperor Cao Rui one final time, before Cao Rui would pass away later on that day. And in their meeting, Cao Rui entrusted Sima Yi to become co-regent alongside Grand General Cao Shuang as he hoped that they can work together to help his heir, Cao Feng, who he had just officially named as Crown Prince on that same day, to become the third emperor of the Wei Dynasty. Now given everything we have mentioned before about Cao Rui's distrust of Sima Yi, this appointment might feel a bit shocking, but to explain all this, we have to go back to June of 238 when Cao Rui's health first started to decline. In the beginning, Cao Rui thought it was just a minor issue, but after not being able to shake the disease by September of the same year, Cao Rui started to reshuffle the courts, as on September 24th, Wei Jin was appointed the Grand Excellency of the Mass position, while Cui Lin was appointed the Grand Excellency of the Work. The third Grand Excellency position, the Grand Commandant, remained in the hands of Sima Yi, who had just defeated Gong Sun Yuan at this time. Now these moves were Cao Rui's attempt at bringing balance to the court, as Wei Zhen was a fierce Cao clan loyalist, as his father, Wei Zi, was the person who had funded Cao Cao's very first army at the time when Cao Cao's own father would not even fund him. Unfortunately, Wei Zi would die in the ensuing battle against Dong Zhuo's forces, but this also meant that Cao Cao essentially got to raise Wei Zhen as his own son out of gratitude for Wei Zi's support and sacrifice. So it's not surprising that Wei Zhen would end up becoming a devoted supporter of the Cao imperial clan. 
Suilin, on the other hand, represented the scholar gentry class as he's the younger cousin of Cui Yan and a member of the prestigious Cui clan of Qinghe. He earned this position through his own merit and reputation for being incorruptible. And with these two appointments, Tare hoped to bring some counterbalance to Sima Yi's ever-growing military success. By December 8th of the same year, Tare's health finally got to a point where even the court historians had to record him as being sick. So we know that this is the point where his illness was quite serious, to the point where he probably could no longer govern or hold court. And Tare probably started to realize that he was most likely going to die from this. So by December 24th, he would officially name his concubine, Lady Guo, as the Empress, a position that had been empty for nearly a year ever since he executed his first Empress of 10 years in Lady Mao back in 237. This move, more or less, was just to ensure that his favorite concubine at the time, Lady Guo, would receive all the honors of being an Empress and that there would be someone to help guide his chosen heir in the future as the Empress Dowager after his death. More importantly on this date, Tare also summons his favorite uncle, Cao Yu, who was in the city of Ye at the time, to come back to the capital and take on the position of Grand General. Tare hoped that Cao Yu would become the trusted imperial prince that can help guide the court as he battles his illness right now, and potentially as the lead co-regent in the future should he die. Now, Cao Yu was just one of Cao Cao's many sons. His mother was Lady Huan, and his older brother was the famous genius child prodigy, Cao Chong. Cao Yu unfortunately did not have his older brother's wits, but he did befriend his nephew, Cao Rei, when the two of them were growing up together in Ye. As despite their uncle and nephew relationship, the two of them were probably very close in age. Cao Yu's exact birth year is not recorded down historically, but estimating the fact that he got his Marquis title in 217, he was probably born in the late 190s or early 200s. This would also line up with the fact that he married his first wife in 215, as this wife was the daughter of Zhang Lu, who surrendered to Cao Cao in this year, with the marriage being part of the surrender terms. And with Cao Rei being born in 204, Cao Yu was probably only 3 to 5 years older than Cao Rei, and this allowed the two to foster quite a friendly relationship during their youth, and once Cao Rei became emperor, he quickly awarded his favorite uncle with the title of Prince of Yan in 232. And in a break away from tradition, in 235, Cao Rei even gave Cao Yu an imperial court position that had previously been strictly forbidden by the founding emperor Cao Pi's policy against giving key posts to imperial princes. Yet despite Cao Rei's affection, Cao Yu was just simply not ambitious, as he would resign from his post in 237 as he opted to return back to the city of Ye to live comfortably as the Prince of Yan. But with Cao Rei's health deteriorating rapidly in late 238, Cao Yu was summoned back once again as he would suddenly be elevated to Grand General, even though he has zero experience with the military up to this point. Now, Cao Rei hoped that Cao Yu, with the help of other generals such as General Xia Hou Xian, General Cao Shuang, Lieutenant Cao Zhao, and General Qin Lang, could help guide the court in this troubling time, and if, say, something happens to him, then these five were the ones he wanted to become co-regents for his heir apparent, Cao Feng. Now, this list is very interesting because they are all essentially Cao clan members, with Cao Yu being Cao Cao's son. Xia Hou Xian is the grandson of Xia Hou Dun and the son of Cao Cao's eldest daughter who married Xia Hou Dun's son. Cao Shuang was the son of Cao Zhen, Cao Zhao was the son of Cao Xiu, and Qin Lang was Cao Cao's stepson with Lady Du from her previous marriage to Qin Yu Lu. Now, none of these five generals and lieutenants earned their titles as most of them had zero military experience, much less court experience. We have already covered Cao Yu's lack of experience and ambition, so let's focus on the other four. Xia Hou Xian is the son of the useless Xia Hou Mao, 
who was already removed from Chang'an immediately following Zhuge Liang's first northern expedition. Cao Shuang was no more than a childhood friend of Cao Rui, and had only hung out within the imperial palace prior to this appointment. He was particularly famous for his indulgence of food, which led to his obese appearance. Cao Zhao, on the other hand, was historically known for being quite beautiful and handsome, and was the boy toy of the bisexual emperor Cao Rui. Qin Long is the only one of the group to have some military experience, as he have fought against the Xianbei in the north and reinforced Sima Yi against Zhuge Liang's final northern expedition. But in reality, Cao Rui just enjoyed Qin Long's company, as Qin Long would never try to correct him or offer him any suggestions or try to sway him on policy or appointment, despite receiving numerous bribes to do so. Naturally, when Cao Rui appointed these five people as co-regents, the imperial court did not respond well, as the lack of merit and lack of balance concerned the court, which was mostly made up of the ruling gentry class. In the past, when Cao Pi had named his co-regents, he went with two Cao clan members in Cao Xiu and Cao Zhen, who were both experienced generals in their own right, and he balanced that with Sima Yi and Chen Chun, who hailed from notable gentry clans, as well the Cao clan was the imperial clan, they needed the support of the notable gentry clans and thus the gentry class at large to rule the entire kingdom. Initially facing the backlash from court, Xia Hou Xian and Cao Zhao responded by making lists of people they wanted to remove after they became co-regents, but this only intensified the resistance, and very soon, with pressure mounting from court, led by two court secretaries in Liu Fang and Sun Zi, who had been court secretaries since Cao Cao's early days as prime minister, Cao Rui finally started to change his mind. Yet Cao Rui was so weak at this point that he could not write and could barely talk, and with his future co-regents at his bedside at all times, Liu Fang and Sun Zi could not find an opportunity to push Cao Rui for a change. Finally, an opportunity presented itself on December 28th to 38th, or just four days after the initial announcement, when only Cao Shuang was present in the room with Cao Rui. Liu Fang and Sun Zi rushed to Cao Rui's bedside, pleading with Cao Rui to change his mind, and Cao Rui finally relented as he too started to notice how inept and power-hungry his co-regents had become now that power was so close within their grasp. Yet if not them, the family and friends that he trusted the most in life, then who should he trust to become co-regents for his adopted son Cao Fang? Seeing that Cao Shuang was still present in the room, Liu Fang and Sun Zi immediately suggested that Cao Shuang was up to the task as long as he had someone senior, like Sima Yi, alongside him as a co-regent. This way, there's a balance between the old and the young, as well as a Cao clan member and a gentry class representation. Hearing this, Cao Rui asked Cao Shuang if he felt he was personally up to the task to become a co-regent with Sima Yi. At the time, Cao Shuang was too nervous to even reply, and an awkward silence fell in the room until Liu Fang stepped on Cao Shuang's foot and whispered in his ear that he should thank the emperor for his trust and that he will use all his might to serve the next emperor Cao Fang alongside his co-regent Sima Yi. And with that, for a moment, Cao Rui changed his mind, until the previous group of co-regent's candidates return and try to sway Cao Rui once again. This led to a period of confusion until later that night, when Liu Fang approached Cao Rui alone, and finally convinced Cao Rui to go with Cao Shuang and Sima Yi. This time, Liu Fang wanted the decision in writing, but it was ready very late, and Cao Rui complained that he was far too ill to write out the edict. So Liu Fang climbed onto Cao Rui's bed, placed the pen in Cao Rui's hand, and guided Cao Rui's hand until the edict was written down on paper. Now armed with the final decision in writing, Liu Fang immediately informed the guards that Cao Yu, Xia Hou Xian, Cao Zhao, and Qin Long's positions had all been revoked by the emperor, and that all four should be removed from the palace immediately. So in one fell swoop, two senior court secretaries changed the course of Wei history 
as Cao Shuang and Sima Yi would go on to become the co-regents for Cao Rei's adopted son, Cao Fang, the third emperor of the Wei dynasty. What happened after was the series of imperial summons for Sima Yi to return to the capital with haste, and our earlier story of how Sima Yi returned just barely in time to see Cao Rei for one final moment before Cao Rei passed away at the age of just 36. And with that, our episode and series on the rise of Sima Yi comes to an end. Our next series will cover Sima Yi's coup, as we'll see how Sima Yi's relationship with Cao Shuang spurred the eventual infamous Gao Pingling incident, and how the coup itself set up the Sima clan for the eventual usurpation of Wei and the founding of the Jin dynasty. So hopefully y'all enjoyed this episode and Siri enough to consider subscribing to the channel or simply hit that like button and leave a comment below to help support the channel. And even without a like bounty, I hope this video can hit that 300 like mark set in the previous video before, as your love and support is very much appreciated. And as always, I will see you all next time. Bye!